about to go live. It should be coming on. Hello. Hey, Ryan, how you doing? Hey, what's happening? Nothing, nothing. It's been a long, long day. How you been? <laughs> well, I'm well. Doing well, good. oh, that's really good. Well, I want to, before I do start, I'm going to introduce myself. My name is Chastity Buckley. I'm the host of Midnight R&B Edition, Hamas and Midnight Love BET, where I give all my flowers to all my R&B artists, singers, songwriters, and everybody who has changed the game in R&B. And I'm here with the multi-Grammy nominated, man, you got so many titles, singer, songwriter, producer, I mean, actor, you've been in the game for so long, almost, I think this is this your 30th year? This year, I think will be What? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> man, you, you don't look, you don't look, so like I said, to say you've been in the game for almost 3 -0, I mean, that is just so amazing. Congratulations, the one and only Mr. Ryan Toby. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Yes, and before we do get started, Ryan, I need to wish you a happy one year anniversary on your songs. Lo uh, lo lo uh, was it Lockdown? Songs for the lockdown. Songs for yes, lockdown. today yes. is uh, volume, I think it's the eighth, the yes. one year anniversary. <laughs> yeah. Man, I was like, wait a minute. I'm like, wait a minute. I got to catch this man on his. Like, I heard it, um, I would say last weekend. It's so dope. You oh. really, really put your heart and stuff in. Um, Thank you so All much. All the songs you done, you done every week. I mean, you you hit one year, so you did ten of them. So yeah. I think you got what eight down that made one year anniversaries uh, this year. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> yeah, I was I was cooking last year. I was cooking. <laughs> you was you was, and you know what? I love it because you really really are a heartfelt person when it comes to R and B. But you really really love what you do. Yes, absolutely. And I'm and I'm so proud of you. That's so happy one year anniversary. That but today we are celebrating the 20th anniversary. Oh my God. <laughs> Thank a you. city high, the stuff yeah. on the Navy album. Wow, mm -hmm. twenty yeah, years, like, like a lifetime ago. It's, it's crazy. I, I, it still feels like it doesn't even feel real. You know what I mean? It's crazy. Yeah, yeah. In some ways, <laughs> and it's so crazy because at the time when this album came out, I actually had just moved to my um, home state, Louisiana. So mm -hmm. the first time I heard about y'all was actually when I moved back home to Louisiana, and it was so crazy because. I actually remember you when I was six years old. I got a story to tell you a little bit before we get started. Okay. I actually was six, mm -hmm. and I was staying in Texas at the time. So I was staying with mom, you know, my sister. We all stayed in Texas. And my godmom, she came to visit me. And mm -hmm. I was so upset because when she came to visit me, whatever like that, she wanted to watch this movie. And I'm like, ma'am, you are interrupting my TV. I want to watch a movie. <laughs> so she took over the whole time when she was there she was coming to visit because not even that you know she's been you know she was a friend of my mom's through everything with all her stuff but she was just so enamored by this movie and so the reason why when she came over the house you know to come visit us and stuff like that she wanted to watch this one movie so she was just so obsessed with this movie and come to find out it was sister act two mm, okay. she watched it every day ryan when, <laughs> when she was down here with us and i was so upset because i was like why is she watching a movie that i'm trying to understand and not even that ryan like, you are the reason why you and Lauren here are the reason why I know who you are today because of that moment. Oh, wow. Thank you. That means it, a lot. <laughs> it changed. And when I say it changed my life, I would say I would say six months later after I seen it in 95 or 96, then I had seen the Fugees and they realized when y'all came on the movie, I was like, Lauren, yeah. I was like, oh, my God. So you have been in my books for almost 25 years, sir. Hey, we got history. <laughs> Too much history. But <laughs> but for the most part, I think my god mom, what you did for that movie for her, what it touched so many ways because you spoke on a heartfelt level of even with inner city kids that were at this school were dealing with so much, but not even that. I think the music brought so much joy. So yeah. joyful, joyful. Thank you so much for that. <laughs> <laughs> Tell God, Mama, I said, what's happening? <laughs> I will. You know, I definitely will because, I mean, she loves that movie with all her heart, and I would say she was the reason why I knew who you were. So without that movie in 1995 for me, I thank her for that. So I'm, I'm glad she kind of tricked me, but I think for the most part it made me change and know who you were. So mm -hmm. thank all you so right. much. I but that. Thank you. Oh, anytime. Thank you. So before <laughs> we do get started, I want to ask you, um, how have you been doing since the pandemic has happened? I know things have changed and stuff like that in your life. How have you been dealing with the pandemic? Um, I've been doing really well, actually. You know, um, it just got me, I like like a lot of people, got me in tune with myself. And like, you know, uh, it's like, what you going to do? What you going to do with yourself? Ain't nothing to do. What you going to do? Yeah. You know what I mean? So um, I just, I, I got more creative, you know, yeah. um, started focusing on my health and fitness and working out. And then I started traveling because flights were cheap. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, 
I just took full advantage of the pandemic, to be honest. Man, <laughs> look, I wish I was like you. Just trying, I wasn't there even nowhere near that. I had so much going on personally because I lost my dad last year. So oh, it so was sorry. a lot on me. Oh, no, it's okay. I lost my uh, my dad and then my uncle was murdered. So I just had so much going on at that time. So me dealing with the pandemic, it was a lot. But I think for me, like you said, creatively, I got to be so intuitive with the music and, you know, just learning about artists and learning about music. I think this show I've done so far has really kind of opened my life up into just being creative and just honoring, you know, rhythm and blues. So thank yeah, you so some, much. Some friends, I lost some friends and loved ones last year, too. You know, some yeah. the corona, some a uh, good friend of mine got murdered as well. And so yeah. I, I, I totally understand. I just try to, you yeah. know, it's like what they say, when life gives you lemons, you know what I mean? Try to make a little, little lemonade with some iced yeah. tea. Yeah. <laughs> well, you did that with 10. Well, you did that with 10. Uh, lockdown thing so you was really in your bag when you did that <laughs> yes yes and so now since we are today talking about the city high 20 anniversary i want to get started about your history of who you are as a person since everybody knows you as this big songwriter and actor from sister i know you're from willemboro new jersey so i want to ask you absolutely i want to rip my city let me let me find out you repping all day every day from uh, the yeah, NJ. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> I wanted to ask you how was it living there and how was it like growing up and who were your inspirations? You know, at the time when you were like starting to learn about R and B. Um, living in Willingboro when I was growing up there it was great. I mean, it was fun. Um, you know, it was uh, it's like a suburb sort of uh, of like Philadelphia mm. and like about an hour and a half south of. Um, not like a suburb of Philly. Let me let me specify because people from Philly gonna be mad. It's in New Jersey, <laughs> but it's about twenty minutes from Philly. So oh, okay. the Philly culture definitely filters over, obviously. Right. Um, and it's it's an hour and a half south of New York, so you got a lot of the New York influence. But it was like a suburb, like a black suburb, where like you know young black families could come and get like you know a house, you know, for cheap, like back in the sixties and seventies. Right. So you had like this suburban area, suburban area, that just had this really dense black culture. Yeah. And so growing up there, um, it was it was great. You know what I mean. Um, you know, uh, I, for some reason, I don't know what was in the water, but just like as far as on the musical scene, like so much talent, singers and writers and dancers and producers and actors and oh my God, athletes. And I don't know what it was, but there was just something in the water and um, kids would, we were just able to like hone our craft and, right. and our skills from that town. Um, so I'm really appreciative for, for, for my hometown and my high school and the music teachers and all the extracurricular, the coaches and everybody that was there. They just really, you know, they, they did their job. They did yeah. their job. So yeah. um, growing up there was great. And um, I was just basically, you know, a little black boy singing in church, you know what I mean? Running the streets, rapping yes. and break dancing and getting kicked out of class, beatboxing and beating on the lunch table and all that nonsense. Yeah. You know, battling and in the hallways and stuff like that and getting mm -hmm. detention and all that. And um, uh, a young friend of mine, when I was about 14, he was like <clears throat> a little brother to me. He was telling me, he's like, man, you should meet my dad. You know, he was like, my dad knows people in New York. You should sing for him. He was like, um, he could probably, you know, get you a record deal or whatever. And I didn't know nothing about that back then. But I, I met his dad at the barbershop and sang for him. And um, he was like, yo, kid, you know, like, with a voice like that, you can make a million dollars. You know what I mean? So, hmm. and at that time in my life, I was calling myself running the streets and, and trying to, you know, get into that other side of, of hmm. uh, you know, that other side of life. But my, oh, parents, but my parents wasn't having it. So... You know, they was basically like, you know, the only thing they would really let me do was go over to, you know, my manager, Marvin Thompson's house to like sing and rehearse and stuff. And Marvin was taking me to Philly, taking me to New York, taking me to studios, taking me to talent contests, putting me in talent shows, taking me to sing at the Apollo and all of that stuff. And um, and then from there, we just started meeting more people <clears throat> and um, met uh, this uh, like senior director of A&R named Kenny Ortiz. Yeah. Um, ah! RCA Records mm. and um, Kenny was working with like SWV and mm -hmm. Pharrell and the Neptunes and, and uh, Kenny wanted to work with me so he started developing me um, getting some songs done on me and uh, Kenny and Marvin together um, with another manager that was working with us at the time named Bobby Humphrey mm -hmm. she uh, they they found out about the auditions for Sister Act and just you know were like yo you should 
you should go try to audition for this movie. Mm -hmm. And I didn't even have aspirations to be an actor like that. You know what I mean? I was so young. I was 14, 15 years old. So it's not like I grew up in a household, you know, with the mom slash right. manager, momager. And that was, yeah. you know, you're going to be a star one day. My baby can sing. Like, it wasn't like that. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> so it, I was just like, oh, you know, I don't, like, don't want to be no actor. Like, you know, I wanted to work a deal. I wanted to make videos. I wanted to be Tevin right. Campbell. You know what I mean? Right. Um, but I went to the audition, sang, and, uh, and, and had to go. Man, I had like seven or eight callbacks for that audition before I got the role. Wow. And, and yeah, and, and and when I when I booked the role, it was the first thing I ever auditioned for, like ever. And when I landed the role, like the lead role that ended up, you know, being what I played in the movie wasn't really even in the original script. I was just auditioning mm. to be one of the background singers, one of the choir members, and they just kept developing a part the part for me bigger and bigger. Kept giving me more lines to say. Some of the some days we would be on set, and the director would just be like, you know, right here, Ryan, I want you to just say da 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 Like, he would just be throwing stuff at me to say. Like, so the part just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And then, you know, of course, they gave me the big solo with the Oh Happy Day. And um, I had no idea that was going to, you know, just make such a mark like it did. <laughs> it did for me. I was, I was just telling my best not to mess up. <laughs> You did that. I mean, for my godmom to even be so invested in that movie every day, that goes to show you you did something. And like, for me, when I first seen it, I was like, oh, these kids are bad. And so when I seen that, I was like, what kind of movie is this? And then as the movie progressed, I was like, wow, they got talented kids in this group. So it goes to show you the thing about you can't judge a book by its cover, but you have to honestly learn that talent is within everybody. So like I said, Sister Act 2 was the one, the reason why I knew who you were. And you know, <laughs> It was really groundbreaking, I think, too, because like you said, I know you said in a lot of interviews, Sister Act 2, I guess, wasn't like a big box office, but it's mm -hmm. been a cult classic. Yeah. And by it being a cult classic, it's gravitated mm -hmm. to people like, you know, kids my age at the time to grown adults who are in their 40s that yeah. love this movie so much because what it means to a lot of us that really have made it from nothing into something. I get DMs even to this day um, <laughs> of like people will DM me and there, it's a video of them video and they're, they're taping their uh, mm. their one year old dancing in front of like this is her favorite movie. The baby is right. one, two, three years old, right in right. front of the TV, dancing while the you know the, the kid you know going. Oh. So I'm like to this day like wow like it's still growing. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's still going and it just is it, it's so humbling and I'm just so appreciative. Yeah, and that definitely for yeah, and definitely for sure. I I did my research, and I know for sure Michael Jackson loved this movie too. Really? Yes, he did. Yes, he did. It was a um, yeah, it was an article. <laughs> it was an article. The King of Pop. The King of Pop. Yes, it was a, um. He really loved this movie. I know for sure. Um, it was something. I think it was in the Jet magazine a couple years back. He was he was so enamored by the movie. He really wanted to sign Lauren here at the time because he seen so much talent in her. But for him, the big up that movie in so many ways and just trying to find out Michael Jackson, yeah, that's really huge. Course. Like, and you know he watched you, so trust, he watched you. Man, you know Michael watched media. you. We had social media back then and Michael would have tweeted about it. We'd have been out of here. Out of here, all right. <laughs> you would have been, you already know. <laughs> but I mean, for people like thinking about, like you said, to be enamored by it, that goes to show you that you meant you and Lauren Hill and everybody in the group, like you had Jennifer Love Hewitt, Whoopi Goldberg, everybody that really came in their own and really just gravitated and dominated the 90s, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And so after that, I know you kind of said, you know, you kind of took a, a stall at the time when you did Sister Act, but I know you actually had did song, right? I know you did the theme song for Between Brothers in 1997. Yeah. yeah you did yeah, that. Yeah, I was, I was, I was writing. <laughs> I was getting my write on, you know what I mean? Yeah. It really started um, in the movie. I wrote the rap in the mm -hmm. uh, Joyful Joyful song, so that's what kind of, like, introduced me to just, like, song publishing and yeah. how that works and um um and song placements having a song placed in the movie mm -hmm. and um so that's what introduced me to the game of writing and then um a couple a few years after that i met jazzy jeff <clears throat> started working with him and that's when like a lot more writing opportunities started coming my way wow. the Between brothers thing um i think that was the first that was the first like job that i did with jeff while i was like signed his company um mm. and uh i did the between brothers theme song and then darius rucker from Hootie and the blowfish came down i wrote his first single and then um man uh uh 
David Hollister and yeah, you did then Will Smith came along and, and it just kept growing and growing from there. Yeah, and that's what I want to talk to you about. You did Miami for that. And I remember that too when I was like nine. But uh, <laughs> in all honesty, I feel like if you if you think about it, when you did that thing for Miami, did you feel like you were going to have a, actually like an anthem for people repping their city? You ever noticed that? Not like, at all. Not at all. Like everything, yeah. everything that I have, that I've been a part of has been a shock to me. <laughs> like the, the success is always because like I'm I would just be so I just want to do a good job. You know what right. I mean? And like it's like I'm just focused on doing my job and, and knocking it out the park and just yeah. doing what I'm supposed to do. And I don't really think too much about like, oh man, this gonna be a hit. This gonna be an anthem. Like I didn't even know what that meant. Especially at that time I was like only like what 20 maybe 20 years mm -hmm. old i don't even think i was 21 when i was working with will and um so i didn't know nothing about like oh yeah this is gonna be an anthem in miami i don't even think i've even been to miami i don't even think oh, wow. i had never even been to miami when i wrote that song mm. so i had no idea the impact that that song was gonna have on on the city that they would be playing it at the basketball games like mm. you know what i mean i didn't i didn't i didn't know at all at all but looking at that, too, I seen that when you did that, you know, you didn't everybody was repping. They said you had Petey Pablo with North Carolina. You had mm -hmm. Jermaine Dupree with Welcome to Atlanta. It's like you kind of gravitate to people to know that, you know, wherever you're from, you can always rep it. But put it in a song and it can gravitate to people, especially when people, you know, you repping for Miami, even though you say you didn't go there. But people from Florida gravitated there. So that goes yeah. to show you that your impact was really gravitating to people at the time. Yeah, for sure. You know? I, I agree. And I mean, you know, truth be told, that was Will's idea. Will... You know, because with our working process at the time, you know, he he would come to the studio and we would kind of it's just kind of like, oh, what you want to, what you want to, what kind of song you want to do today? Hi. And he, you know, he was just coming up with all kind of concepts, ideas, what he want to talk about, what he don't want to talk about. Mm -hmm. And um, he was like, yo, let's let's make a song about like like a, like a dope ass city. <laughs> and so we started talking about it, like places he's been and you know what cities he like. Oh, New York, da 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 da. Paris is crazy because of this and. This city is dope because of that. L.A. is dope. Blah, blah, blah. And he was like, nah, let's let's talk about Miami. That was Will's idea. And, wow. Uh, and and then uh, he, he, he would just turn me loose and let me just, you know what I mean, pin it out. And um, then he would come back and, like, kind of proofread it. Like, yeah, I like this. I don't like that. Uh, maybe change this. You know, keep that, you know. And then um, and then he would go in the booth and, and, and spit it. So, yeah. yeah, shout out to the big homie He because he called that one. <laughs> man very true and i remember back then when i was growing up big willie style was huge yeah that was, was such a huge album back then you like y'all really were dominating radio waves everywhere yeah. <laughs> and it was just gravitating to like young kids but not even just that what you did for will was you just gave him an impact to understand that you know getting jiggy with it and Miami and all those anthems right there. It was really an anthem for the 90s at the time. And I know you said you had went to school in Gramlin. Did you go to Gramlin University? Is that in Louisiana? That's the one you went to? Yeah, in Gramlin, Louisiana. Yeah. That's where I'm from. Oh, <laughs> Up in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Oh, you're okay, okay, okay. But I know the robbery. Yeah, I only, I, yeah right? I only, yeah. went for, um, I only went for a semester, though. Oh, wow. I, I quickly found out that wasn't for me. Wow. So, you know what I mean? I found out the street life wasn't for me and the college mm. wasn't for me. <laughs> right. But so with I, that, I mean, you you know in your heart that the talent was always in music. So Yeah, I wanted to make records. I wanted to make music. I wanted to make, mm. you know, that was my passion. Um, even more so than acting. It was always about song. I want to hear, hear my songs on the radio. Right. I wanted to be in music videos. I would watch. I was obsessed with MTV, obsessed with rap city, BET, on TV raps. <laughs> like, I grew up when all of those, I'm from the era that saw those shows be created. Like, I remember there not yeah. being a Yo MTV raps. And then it was like, there's a new show called Yo MTV raps. And then there wasn't yep. a rap city. And then, like, there's a new show called Rap City. There's a new show called Video Soul and all the, you know what I mean? Yeah. So I, I, it was like I was obsessed with like I want to do that. I want to make music. I want to you know uh, I want to go on tour. I want to perform and I want to be in videos. Like that mm. was all my passion. Always mm. still is still is. Wow, that's wow. That's that's really amazing. Like I said, for you to be in the game for three O, it's just really music is always within you. It's always you. It is you. So mm -hmm. with that, like how did like was Will Smith like your first break in the industry? Like was that your first gateway when DJ Jazz Jam put you on with that? As far as what, writing? Just music. 
music, nah, I mean, Sister Act really kind of put me in the game. Mm -hmm. um, I would say, obviously, on the acting side. Yeah. And then to showcase my voice. Um, mm -hmm. And and I got a chance to write in the movie, so it, it introduced me to the writing side. I think, yeah, I would have to maybe say yes then with the Will Smith stuff. That was the that was my first big project that I was okay. on, you know, okay. um, on the music side because <clears throat> I had done some other things with Jeff, but uh, and through Jeff's camp. But the Will Smith well, that one took off. That one went crazy. Wow. So <clears throat> that was that was like my first introduction to like, oh, this is what it's like to sell like you know twenty million records. That, oh, that, that's what mm. that check looks like. Oh, that's mm. cool. you know what I mean. You made my heart hurt. You know you went diamond on confessor, so I was like, oh, you just said <laughs> Big Willis. Like, oh, look. Okay, yeah, yeah. Will, Will, Will did about twenty two million. I, I, wow. I, I touched them numbers a couple times. Come on, <laughs> let these let these people know your records. That's why I be telling people let these people know because what I do on my show. I want to make sure that you're always uh, honored and stuff. You know, like I said, those numbers don't lie. And when you have the proof to show that because you gravitated to so, so much, yeah. <laughs> that is just crazy. So at this time, we're, I think we're like literally in the late 90s. So how did you get the introduction to like Wyclef Jean and that City High type of era? What did that start? Did it start in late 99? Mm, let me see. Or 98. 98. It was like 98. But I, I knew Wyclef through Lauren Hill already from mm -hmm. Sister Act. So like I, I remember battling rap battling Wyclef outside of Lauren's crib at her baby shower. Like You battle? Wyclef and Prize <laughs> and John Forte at the time. So like I knew who Wyclef was and, and yeah. he, knew, he knew full well who I was. And then um it was just like, you know, fast forward, it kind of mm. came full circle um a couple of years later <clears throat> when um I was working with uh Robbie who was the other guy in in my group. Yeah, and, and he was signed to Wyclef and Jerry's uh, label, Book of Basement, mm -hmm. and I was writing songs for him. And then, um, and then we went to the studio one day because um, Wyclef was working on Whitney Houston's "My Love Is Your Love," and he wanted yeah. Robbie to sing some vocals on it. So Robbie just wanted me to tag along or whatever. And at this time, I'm just the songwriter that's writing for Robbie. So. Um, I went to the studio and when Clef saw me, he was like, "Yo, this little nigga right here battled me for three hours in front of Lawrence Crane. You know what I mean? So he was he was like already in love with me, you know what I mean? Like, oh, yo, man. bro, like what you doing now? Like what's going on? Blah 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 blah. And uh, you know, and then that's how that relationship started to, you know, turn and turn evolve into something more. You know, right. he was like, Yo, you should come rock with us. We got a new label, blah, 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 blah. You know, we can sign you, this, that, and the third. And, um, you know, they, they offered me a deal I couldn't refuse at the time. So hmm. I took it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, if it was if it was rewarded for you, definitely take it. Because, like I said, you already proved your point in, in Will Smith. So doing that, you already with Lauren and yeah. Michael and John and stuff like that. So with that, you were writing for Robbie. So did y'all get to a point where y'all were like, Going to form a group together at that time, or how um, was that? Yeah, so so that night, actually, it was that night it, we he was working on the Whitney Houston song. Mm -hmm. um, he was like, "Yo, you want to sing some vocals?" Like he, he just turned the mic on, like, "Yo, just get on the mic, like you need some ad So I was doing ad libs and singing background harmonies and stuff like that. And he was just like, "Yo," I, he didn't realize that I was the guy that was writing these songs that he was liking for his artist Robbie. So he like, "Yo, you the songwriter." And you know, you, you, I know you dope, blah, 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 blah. He was like, yo, you should come rock with us. He was like, matter of fact, y'all chemistry is so dope. He was like, y'all should be a group. Y'all should be like a duo, like a little young Casey and JoJo. And um, and so we was just talking about it that night. Like just, I'm like, like, what? Like a group, like, I don't know, man. But Robbie, you know, he was like, no, nah, like, I think that would be dope. Like, I need you, bro. Like, I think, you know, we, we, we just got a great vibe together. And, you know, and then they was like, yo, we'll give you this money and da 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 da, da. you know, mm -hmm. we popping right now, blah, 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 blah. Which he was, White Club was on fire at the time. He was. So, so I was like, I was like, okay, you know what I mean? So we like mm -hmm. formed the group that night. It was, that was the group. And then we started trying to come up with a name. And then, you know, weeks and, you know, started, went past or whatever. And then we finally came up with the name City High. And it was originally. Mm -hmm. Robbie and myself, we were the group. We were City High. Okay. Um, and then uh, Claudette came into the picture because she used to 
same backgrounds. Um, we knew her from Willingboro, and she was in a girl group at the time. And um, but she used to, you know, come through all the time and sing on stuff, and we would have her sing on stuff. And um, when we played Wycliffe and the, the "What Would You Do" song, that they heard her singing the chorus. And who was that girl? So we, you know, we introduced her to them, and they fell in love with her. And they was like, "Yo, you should come rock with us." Like Wycliffe was just snatching everybody up at that time. Man, <laughs> and he did the right thing because when I think of you guys, I so think of the Fugees. Y'all so remind me of the Fugees. But <laughs> not even that, I started to think too as time went on and I listened to this album. Y'all so remind me of Groove Theory. Oh wow, nice Groove Theory. Yeah. Because I know for me, Claudette, she sounds like a male. Yeah. And I think of her voice because it's so pure and it's just so yeah. eloquent. But it, it ties into the hip hop beats as y'all were putting on. I was like, man, y'all got a Groove Theory, Coffee Brown. <laughs> like, Wyclef was mixing it up. But what I love about Wyclef, he, he keeps it hip hop, but he has this R&B vibe that he puts out together. And I love the mixture of both because I know we always have this issue with the R&B and hip hop should stay apart. But I love it because it's black music. You know what I'm saying? It's for us. Absolutely. So looking back at it now, I'm like, man, I really can see a Groove Theory-esque yeah, type with y'all. I, I get that for sure. And I see it because, like I said, Robbie and you, y'all vocals are just beautiful. I know for me, those one song that reminds me of a KT and JoJo esque is so many things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I yeah. listened to that about like three or four times. My favorite <laughs> one is "You Don't Know." You don't know, y'all went to church. Hey. Y'all went to church. <laughs> I was like, when was it you that bust that high note? Because I know you in those high notes at the I end probably, of this. Probably, I don't remember. Because <laughs> that you don't know me. It's a gospel ass like blues. It's Absolutely. just so dope. Absolutely. And that's why I like when I listen to a lot of these songs, I'm like, this is like so much ask of the Fugees, but y'all had your own sound. And that's why, even though the comparison is always with y'all, y'all mm -hmm. like totally two totally different roots because y'all can sing, but y'all also have this rap ass type of uh, vibe. But y'all also had, you were like pretty much like Triple Threat. Y'all sing, y'all <laughs> act, you know, wrote. I mean, y'all had all the ingredients to make this super cool. So in the process, no problem. In the process of that, like, how was it making the first, like, your self titled debut album? And what would you do? And like, was, what would you do, a true story? <laughs> yeah, kind of, kind of. It was a little, what? It, wow. It, it, true, true elements to okay. the song. And then there was some fabrication as far as just being okay. poetic and just writing yeah. a cool story that would be, like, relatable. Yeah. Um, that's just kind of how I wrote. You know, really mm -hmm. how I feel right. You know, like yeah. I could take a piece of a conversation and a piece of this, and maybe even a piece of something I saw on TV mm -hmm. that was really dope, or a movie, or whatever. Something I read in a book or heard on a podcast, and then like right. craft a song and a story a a around it. Um, yeah, the process was really. It was, it was fun. Obviously, we was excited. Mm -hmm. You know, we had a record deal. Um, going back and forth to New York, we would be like, because I had a studio in my house, mm -hmm. um, at my parents' house at the time. And um, and then Robbie had like a little setup, some equipment at his parents' house at the time. Yeah. So we would be over his house cooking up ideas and beats and stuff like that. I think mm -hmm. we recorded What Would You Do? Like in Robbie's bedroom. What? And we recorded that song in his bedroom. I remember like sitting on the side of his bed and like had the little like had the speakers right here and like this wow. little 12 track digital recorder and like little mpc machine and keyboard and we we like in little microphone <laughs> like right there in his bedroom like we was right there in his bedroom wow. like, you know for that song to take us all around the world was crazy like seeing yeah. people sing that song in countries and they don't even speak english but they singing every word so we would um we would be like we would come up with our ideas we would record mm -hmm. our songs either at his place my place and then uh and then we would kind of have like these weekly bi-weekly meetings with Wyclef and Jerry where they would be, they would call us up to New York mm -hmm. <laughs> and we would go up to New York and play them what we've been working on right and they would like listen and you know what I mean? Oh, we like this. We don't like that. We, we need to flush this idea out a little more. This is like a good rough, rough idea, blah, blah, blah. Oh, this is fire. You know, and they would just kind of go through everything. And like, that's how the process went. But hold on. Let me, let me, let me backtrack. That's how we ended up working. Initially, mm -hmm. they had us coming to 
the Booger Basement damn near every day, which Ooh. was the studio that was at Jerry Wonder's mom's house, the, the studio that the Fugees did their album in. Wow. In East Orange, New Jersey, like in the hood. Oh. And um, <laughs> so we was going there like an hour and a half from Willingboro to East Orange. Right. Every day, which was grueling. It was, it was, it was <laughs> oh my God, because sometimes we wouldn't leave out of there until. So y'all were going through artist, artist development. And oh my God, and we <laughs> an hour and a half. Both ways, like every day. Oh, wow. And, and um, oh my God, it was crazy. This before Uber. So we had like six hundred dollar car services, seven hundred dollar car service, and and this is all going against our budget. <laughs> yeah, you know that first time audit yeah, budget man. is a lot. <laughs> this is all coming out of our budget. So, <clears throat> so we uh we were we were going back and forth to the booger basement. We were, that's how we were recording the album in the beginning. Yeah. And I remember we had a conversation with Wyclef and Jerry, like, yo, man, like, we got our own studios, like, in, you know, at, at home, like, we don't need to be coming back and forth up here. But they just felt like, yo, this is where the, stu the Fuji's made their magic. <laughs> Fuji sold 20 million records. Y'all mm. need to make y'all magic here. There's something special about this studio. And it was something definitely special about that studio, but it was like, that was y'all vibe. Our right. Vibe is in our city, you know yeah. what I'm saying? That's it, New Jersey. So they, they they were understanding of that, and they was like, all right, cool. And then that's when we switched to, like, working between my house, Robbie's house, and then we would just come up for these bi-weekly listen sessions, if you will. Wow. And, uh, yeah, that's how that process went. And um, I don't, I don't, I can't remember how long it went on. Maybe, maybe, I don't know, maybe three, four months, five months. It felt like a long, it felt like forever. It might have been a year. Might have yeah. been like a year or two before the album was done. Like a year, I think. Yeah. And and that's how it is. Well, I know back in the time when, you know, when CDs and stuff were out, that's how it kind of is when you're in the process of making like a great album. Yeah. And that's how it is, you know, when you are starting out making, when you're on your first record and stuff like that, it takes months, you know, to you to come out with the best, you know, ideas and, you know, songs that you want to create. And like I said, for what would you do to just take off the way you did? I mean, in Louisiana, we played it every day. No, every no. day. No. <laughs> I actually was so obsessed with that song. I had my own cassette tape and I recorded the whole song. Oh, but wow. I started to realize, too, I actually heard the song in 2000. So in the Life soundtrack, my mom, um, before we actually moved back to Louisiana, we went to go see the Life movie in theaters. Yeah. And I didn't realize it back then, but I was like, I remember at the end of the um, scene where, you know, they escaping uh, from jail and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And the song comes on the baseball stadium, and I was like, whoa. And then I heard it, and after that, I didn't hear it no more. So when I moved to Louisiana in 2001, and y'all were playing on MTV2, MTV, BT, like they were playing this song heavily. It was so dope. And I was so upset with that. I miss, I miss the MTV. Yes, me, me days. too. Like, and then like, I was so obsessed with it. <laughs> yes, and then I was so obsessed with it. I literally bought a cassette tape and recorded the whole song. And I played it back over and over and over again. <laughs> yeah, the song was originally supposed to be uh, the first single or or one of the sing first or second single off of the life soundtrack. That what? Was, yeah, we were supposed to launch from the life yeah. soundtrack. Because, you know, back then, that was back when, like, soundtracks was, like, popping. Like, Nutty Professor. And Rush Say the last dance. And, like, yeah, like, soundtracks was, like, how you can launch an artist. Yeah. So, um, you know, we were, we were, we were on the, uh, the, we were supposed to come out on off the Life soundtrack, but yeah. R. Kelly, um, I don't know what happened, because Wyclef and R. Kelly were co-executive producing that. So Wyclef was doing half the album. The mm. soundtrack and Wyclef was doing half the uh, 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 soundtrack. R. Kelly and Wyclef. So right. I think like each one of them was supposed to be able to get a single off. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Yeah. Um, but Kells just came through with them Smith Ashes with the Life song with Casey yeah. and JoJo and the Maxwell record and Fortunate. And yeah. So it was like our little group. You know, we got trumped out. You know what I mean? To to the king of R and B. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it is what it is. But hey, you made your mark in 2001. And that's why I'm yeah. just so proud of you guys. Because I know for me, I've heard what would you do, you know, like I said, and now people have taken this song and made it into um, to little skits and stuff. Yeah. I don't know if you have seen it in 2017, yeah. Kevin on stage, they did the best struggle food. And yeah. they were talking about the food back in the day that we see yeah. that, you know, when you're struggling, you eat and he was yeah. like, 
you know, he just going through things. He was like, what would you do when you signed in? Everybody was like, that city high. And everybody just <laughs> knew it and went crazy. <laughs> but what was so great, I know last year, a comedian named Amber Ruffin, yeah. she did an episode on her thing on Peacock called Being Mad in 1999. And y'all were the theme um, on one of her episodes. I love and it, I thought it was just so dope. And I was, was like, so wow. Too. <laughs> <laughs> you thought it was true. Look, I was so done. I said, It was so wow. true. Wow. I was like, man, we would have got murdered if we came out with that record now, boy. You, I wouldn't even think to try to write no shit like that now. I'm well, you know what? In all honesty, though, my, my, that story needed to be told. Yeah. Because for people like me, you know, I never had people like that growing up personally, thank God. But I can't get mad for people that have gone through stuff like that. Because some people, that's how they get it, you know? Yeah. And I was raised in a single parent home. You know, my mom, we struggled the beginning of my first year, which is so gravitating because the song made so much sense to, you know, single women who've gone through things and have to take care of kids to really try to make it through. You get what I'm saying? And so... I, I mean, my, my, you know, uh, some of that was like my mom's story a little bit. You yeah. Know? So that's where the lyric, you know, if my mother had could do it, maybe you could do it. If my mother could do it, you could like, so... Yeah. But there was a lot of naivete and just young, like, yeah. you know, I wasn't trying... Nobody was thinking about being politically correct back then. You just yeah. said what, that you just said it how you said it. My heart was in the right place when I wrote yeah. it, but I totally understood what she meant on the peacock show i was like yeah <laughs> maybe that, approach, <laughs> that approach could have been a little a little softer touch <laughs> <laughs> but it was but hey it had people talking again and that's what i was so excited about because when i seen it it made my heart feel like wow you know people 19 years later at the time were still talking about this song and then you have but still and moxie raya you know did a cover song to what would you they made it like a pop version you know i love r&b i'm an r&b head but for it's a term pop yeah. And going to other countries that, like I said, it went number one. You went international with this song. You know what I'm saying? So this song really did mean to a lot of people. And I know it was a uh, comment in the section. The best line they loved in it was what you said, um, was every day I wake up hoping to die. Yeah. That line right there has really touched a lot of people because they can feel that in people. Yeah. So why, how do you feel that people really feel that from your line, them, you saying that every day I wake up hoping to die? I mean, it's, it's, it's true. I mean, yeah. I feel like that sometimes, you know what I mean? Like we all pandemic. Go, you know what I'm saying? We all yeah. go through it just, you know, and and just trying to figure things out and, yeah. and trying to just find your place in this world. You know what I yeah. mean? Um so it it's it's a blessing to yeah. see that people connect to that line. Mm -hmm. Um and, and if it motivates people in any way to keep going and it just gives them something that they feel like they can relate to. I mean, it, I just feel so blessed and honored to, to have a gift to be able to use my gift in that way. It means yeah. the world. Yeah, but if for everybody to gravitate to that one line, it's like, wow, Ryan was really speaking to a lot of the yeah. youth and us. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, And then after that, you released Caramel. Oh, yeah. the one that I love. Yes, I do. <laughs> I love me some Caramel. I, yeah. mean, I remember y'all performing that on MTV Awards. Now, that Ooh. right there was a moment. Yeah. Yeah, well, I was okay. so excited to see that. And then now, if you notice, um, the rapper Tissy and Mulatto have actually sampled this song, 5-5. Five, yeah. Five. Yeah, so man. how do you feel that you got sampled not so long ago? Was it a week or two ago they just dropped yeah, the song? Yeah, man, I felt, I felt amazing. <laughs> like, you know, it's like to be at that age now and to have that ca a catalog that mm. you know, has stood, stood the test of time and it's aged yeah. so well. And it's at that place now where it can be sampled and remade and remixed. And I'm just yeah. like, man, like, you know, <laughs> on, 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 on a, one side, it kind of make you feel a little old. Like, damn, I'm, I'm old enough to have my stuff, you know what I'm saying, sampled. Like, <laughs> wait a minute, young man. You want to sample my, sample my music, my repertoire, young man? <laughs> but, then, but hey. But at the same time, it make me feel really good, you know, yeah. um, that the youth and that you know the culture want to flip my shit like that's that's what it's about like i mean that's what hip-hop was built on so yeah i'm excited I, and you know when i got the sample request um they sent a, a copy of the song and the song was fire so it was i was like, like of course i'm like yeah flip that shit, bro make it yeah let's get that money <laughs> yes <get the, laughs> but five five i was like wow they took the height line and made it the song, which was dope. But I love that the youth from today is really bigging y'all up. Because like I said, City High, y'all really made a movement. And just seeing y'all perform the song when I was 12 years old on MTV, 
um, MTV Music Awards was really dope because I was like, oh my God, City High is getting a shine. They about to kill it. I mean, y'all were on the charts with people like Michael Jackson. Y'all were on the charts with, you know, up and newcomers like Tang, Jaheem. Y'all were really on your way. Mm -hmm. And then you got nominated for a Grammy with this, um, with this album. Congratulations on that years ago. I mean, I just feel like it was so dope. And a lot of stuff that I really understood and learned from this album, this, this album is like really like a conscious type album mm -hmm. to me. Yeah, yeah. I know for me, um, yesterday was the 50th anniversary of Marvin Gaye's yeah. What's Going On album, and it reminds me so much of this in some type of way, but on a, a 2001 version, if you think about it. Yeah. And when I look back, I was listening to a lot of songs, and I remember you did Big Up Marvin Gaye, so, which was weird. I mean, like, one day apart, y'all literally got the... <laughs> yeah, that's wild. That's, that's wild. Yeah. But, when I, but when I learned from this album is it's very conscious about the youth, the Black youth, and it's really understanding that, you know, the struggle is real, but you can make it out your struggle. And that's what I learned from you guys. Yeah. And, you know, with that, I love cats and dogs, you know, even though y'all was going toe to toe on them, them raps. I was like, wait a minute, ho. Yeah. Uh. You know what's funny? I, um, <laughs> I was just texting uh, Claudette yesterday. And yes. I was like, yo, I said, I forgot that you was spitting on the on the she, all this song, Cats and Dogs. I was like, yo, you killed that shit. <laughs> Lauren Hill Jr., Lauren Hill Jr. And I said, look, I told my friend, Jay, yeah, I was like, shout out to my friend. Yeah, I was like, okay, with the bars. Like, I told yes. this guy, like, yo, yeah, that's right. You did rap on the beginning of that song. I was like, yo, you body <laughs> that. <laughs> yes, and send him my love for me because, I mean, hearing her voice on The Only One I Trust, that's a ride or die record. Oof, Only One I Trust was, that was, that was, that was crazy. Damn, we was really in our bag, baby. Y'all were in y'all yo, bag. you making me feel, you making me feel all the feels right now, yeah. <laughs> but, but Brian, that's but Brian, this is what I, I understand about R and B. Like with the Kevon thing, like I said, for the twenty seven they did the struggle thing, they was like it was funny. It was funny, but then it made it was like somebody had put it back and was like they was like, Why would we listen to what would you do? The man one one thing I love with the man said, he said, This is R and B. He said, This is rhythm and blues. Yeah. So for somebody to big you up and said that, you know, they were saying, why did we sing this song? But the guy was giving y'all props that this is rhythm and blues type of music. We need that music. You know what I'm saying? Because we get so lost, I think, in the hip-hop stuff mm -hmm. that when I really listened to this album, this was just so neo-soul, yeah. R&B, yeah. hip-hop. It was just on a whole nother level that you were coming into the new millennium and, and changing the game with this. You know what I'm saying? Because Cats and Dog was everything. But the only one I trust, that's that Rod Dog record. <laughs> you going to really tell go do. Is he going to uh, get arrested for him selling drugs? Because that's a ride or die type of mentality. I'm just saying. Right? <laughs> yeah, we were just trying to, you know, the goal of the album was like, rather than make like a typical yeah. R&B, lovey-dovey, every song's a lovey-dovey yeah. type of album, we just wanted to like paint other pictures. You know what I mean? Yeah. Just paint other pictures and just give people these other like cinematic themes on songs, you know yeah. what I mean, and, kind of, and tell dope stories, that's all. Just wanted to yeah. be, like, really, really uh, poetic and different, you know? That's what you did. It, you did, and why? And I'm so happy you said that, because Why was definitely a record like that, because when I listen to Why, it's about, you can be in love with somebody, but the thing about it is you can still have problems, but don't talk about them unless you're just worried about the sexual, not the emotional. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And when I say, when you listen to this album, it really is very conscious because you have to really understand from as a people, like I said, City High Anthem is a beautiful record. It's a beautiful, beautiful record. It reminds me of Mercy Mercy a little bit. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it does in that type of, because it talks about the things and Save the Children, like on Marvin Gaye's yeah. album, that really talk about the youth yeah. and the black youth about, you know, uplifting them because we needed records like this. You know, I needed a record like this, you know, coming from a single parent home. Come and learn about my life, but not even that this album really shows that, you know, you were making conscious statements of what was going on in the world, you know? Yeah. And so yeah. I'm just proud of you guys that y'all did this album because I really had to sit back and think like, man, they was really speaking to me and I wasn't even paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and we were yeah. it, we were trying to definitely make statements, but yeah. we weren't overthinking it though. It wasn't mm. like, you know, we want to be real so super deep and so super heavy and we're going, you know, it's going yeah. to be lasting and people will talk about this 20 years from now. Like, yeah. we had no idea that the, 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 the forefront of it was to just make great music and just yeah. make songs that just felt good. And, you know, as far as content, it was more like we just was writing about what we felt at the time. 
there was nothing deeper behind it or you know yeah. we're trying to make a classic or we're trying to you know be conscious and it wasn't <laughs> even like that we were just trying to like we were just trying to yeah. write cool shit <laughs> you know and, it, and that's the part that is so humbling because it's like you don't even realize like just the impact that you're gonna have just being yourself you know come on <laughs> Just being yourself, like, you know, because we think that you got to do so much. You got to, like, wake up in the morning and put on the right wig with the right lashes and the right boots right. and the right, and you got to be perfect and you got to say the right thing. And the per it's like, yeah, it was really you just saying good morning to me when, you know, or you just holding the door for me at the gas station or you right. just complimenting me on my shoes. Oh, I really like your shoes. Wow, thank you. Like, it's, it's just those little things, like, you just yeah. being you or your smile or, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. That it's like, yo, me just seeing your smile every day is what got me through, unbeknownst to you. You yeah. know what I mean? It's like, yeah, man, your smile every day. Every time you call, I mean, for instance, you just doing this interview and you being so excited about the music, it's like you making me feel good. Like, <laughs> well, you were one of my best friends. Because, you know, like, for somebody yeah. like me who's been in, been in the game so long, yeah. And writing so many songs and like, you know, yeah. like you forget. And then, you know, with the music industry is a, a what have you done lately type of industry. So yeah, always trying to top your, your last thing. Your best hit, your biggest outdo hit. Outdo yourself, outdo yourself. It's never good enough. You could do better, you could do better. So to have somebody like you come along, mm -hmm. like, oh my God, this was amazing. And do you, and what about on this? And this song, was, and it's like, oh shit, wait a minute, wait. <laughs> So I, that was really good. Yeah, like, you know, and that's, that's, it, it, it really blows my mind. Like, wow, like just being yourself, just doing what you naturally love yeah. can just have such an impact on people more than what you could ever even imagine. That's amazing. Yeah. That's really amazing. <laughs> yeah, Ryan, but you know, definitely for sure. That's why I do what I do because what I've learned in life, or not even just life, just in understanding about the history, the history is always going to be there, but you got to keep the legacy preserved, you know? And I think for me, because I'm such an R&B head and I love R&B music, just like all my friends, you know, will have 90s mood, um, the R&B representatives, people who really, really make sure that our legacy is preserved to make sure that we know no matter what has happened when people are dead and gone, like the album, the song you did, a song for you, the uh, cover song y'all did on y'all album for Donny Hathaway. Mm -hmm. uh, people may not know Donny ha Hathaway, but because you covered it, you made sure that his legacy is still preserved. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So, and y'all, and R Robbie, oh my God, his vocals, like, yeah. I know your vocals, you are just a talent, <laughs> but for Robbie to do justice on that song, yeah. I was like, wow, he really, really yeah. can sing. Like, y'all was some singing brothers and sister. Yeah. Shout out to my girl, Claudia. He would, play, he would play that on the piano. Man. He would just bust out and start playing that on the piano. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that was, that was, that was crazy. Damn, I forgot yeah. he did that remake. Yeah, y'all did Donnie Hathaway. You know I got a big up Donnie. Look. <laughs> We got some nerve, huh? Gonna yeah. make a Donny Hathaway song, like. But y'all killed it. But y'all killed it. Hey. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> hey, but it goes, but it goes to show you. But even with that, even the Grammys had to give you a nomination for a Grammy for this album because, like I said, for what would you do to really just gravitate to the youth of my age and people on love? It goes to show you that City High was at a time here to stay. But I know you guys went your separate ways. I want to ask you, and I don't know if you want to ask this because out of respect for you, I want to ask you, but you don't have to answer the question. Um, do you feel that the reason why you didn't make a sophomore album was because of the personal issues that you had with the group? Absolutely. That is the reason. <laughs> oh, wow, that was? Okay. <laughs> that is it. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. We, you know. And I was waiting. A lot of the inner turmoil. Yeah. You know, me and Claudette started dating. She, you know, she got pregnant. Like, yeah. Things got, you know, hairy. <laughs> well, well, don't feel bad. I was in a oh, I don't same bad. situation. Not like that. I don't feel bad. But I can relate to you, Ryan, because for me personally, I can speak on a personal standpoint. I actually dated um my best friend's ex boyfriend. Okay. So I truly understand. Oh yes, I did. You get it? So you got it. You yeah. live and you learn, but what I learned was you can't judge a book by its cover because unless you don't know what nobody's been through. You yeah. don't want to speak on that. Yeah. And I know for sure for me, you know, I do feel like, you know, I'm not too much sure about y'all, but I know my situation, I can understand from what you went through because when you try to prove to people what happened and stuff like that, it goes to show like people want to make their own judgment. But if you're not in the bubble, you don't understand it. You know what I'm saying? And I know for me, because I was in that bubble 
and I understood it. And I wasn't, you know, being on no vindictive type of stuff. It's like I fell in love. Like I couldn't control my feelings. But you know, some people got hurt in the process. The heart, you know, wants what the heart wants. Heart wants. <laughs> and, you know, it's like, you yeah. know, when you're young and and yeah, yeah, and of course, there's probably there's so many layers and other you know issues that played a yeah. part, which don't even matter. But it's yeah. like you you do things sometimes without thinking it all the way through, you know. And, and spread a moment, yeah. You know, and people people can get hurt, and it's yeah. just important to learn and 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 move on because at the end of the day like nobody really cares like you know what i mean people only care because it's just hot topic for the moment but yeah. everybody got their own stuff they're dealing with nobody really cares and then you know you're 20 years after it, it's like nobody yeah, really yeah. doesn't care so it's kind of like one of those things where it's all a part of the story it's all a yeah. part of the story it, yeah. it, it, you know and and the whole the whole key I was in the studio with Luke James, my bro, Luke James, uh, last weekend. He got nominated for a grant. I seen yeah. that. You got nominated for a Grammy yeah, too. Yeah, Congratulations. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. So we're, we're starting on his second album. Okay. And, um, we were just talking in the studio and we were just like, you know, you got to finish the book, man. You know, yeah. you, you can't, you can't stop in the middle at chapter 40. Like, yeah. Oh my God, but did you see what what she did when she was twenty two? Did you see how she did it? Nah. Yeah. The whole book. You gotta finish the whole book because yeah. we don't know who the winners and losers are until the game is over. So it's like we got we gotta finish the whole book, and and yeah. you know that's that's what it's about. That's yeah. What it's about. Yeah, and I, you know what? Even with all the stuff that happened, you really were wise. like I said, we didn't know about it till years later. I didn't. But my thing about us, I never judge Cardin or you or anybody in the group because it was my story. And when I listened to Ben, oh, no. how can I judge when I was in the one, too? Look, I can't do that. No, man. No, sir. No, sir. But oh, what I took and I understood from y'all's story was they're just regular people that's just had the same stuff that I had. And, and I listened to Best Friends. I listened to that song. That reminds me of my story. Oh. And I was like, ooh. That's what's I funny. Was, I wrote I wrote that song way before. That's the funny part. So and, it's like and, you and know, people like, it became oh, my he wrote a song about it. I'm like, no, nah, actually, the best friend song was written way before, and then it just kind of like played out that way. I don't know, maybe it was yeah. self fulfilling prophecy. I don't know, but well, it was um, a problem for my life. Yeah, because <laughs> <laughs> it because it happened to me. And when I listened to it, I'm like, this is my story. It was when I listened to the song and I read the lyrics, I was like, this is my story. Yeah. And I was so happy I heard that song because what I understood was it can relate to real life. Yeah. But if, you know, if you're not in it and you don't understand it, you're not going to know it. But like I said, too, I don't really blame anybody because at the end of the day, no matter what has happened, y'all have done so many, well, you have done so many great things after that. And I just feel like regardless of what happened in the personal things of your group, you really, really showed that no matter what happened, you gotta keep going. Absolutely. You can't stop. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. It was it was tough for a time. And, yeah. You know, a lot of healing needed to take place. Yeah. Forgiveness needed to take place. It got really rough for a minute, but um yeah. everybody's in a much better place now. And um and you know, it it's a part of the story. Like it is. It's like, you know, it's you know what's crazy? Yeah. I don't know if you saw the Tina Turner, uh, was it I Am Tina, I think it is? Oh, the doc I saw a little bit. I, I didn't catch the whole thing. So. Nah, but when you, when you watch it, um, she just talks about how, like, out of everything she's done, she said any interview she does, she was doing, especially at the time when she was breaking all these records and she had got away from Ike and she was doing all this big stuff, movies, right. and had these, had sold 20 million records and all this other stuff. Everybody keep asking her about Ike. Everybody, and and she and it was like she said it was just so hard um, to to have to keep reliving that, have to keep talking about it in yeah. interviews and stuff like that. But like she also came to the place where she understands like that's that's a part of the story. Yeah. You don't even, you don't even get the what's love got to do with it, Tina, without the Ike part. Like, yep. You know what I mean? Like and as horrific as it was that's what made her who she is yeah. you know what i mean and and, yeah. and a lot of times i think we just we don't we don't we we punish ourselves for decisions we made in yeah. the past and we don't realize how it's all a part of the story you don't yeah. get one without the other mm -hmm. so it's like you learn to accept it as long as you learn from it and you heal properly 
and you just stay, you you remain healthy and get to that healthy place, yeah. then you still got so much more life to just write more story, you know? Right. And so yeah, so it's, you know, I'm excited and I'm just happy. I'm happy that everybody's in a good place and that, you know, life is just moving on. You know? Yeah, miss you guys. Kind of sad, but you know, Aww. hey, it it is. But you know what I learned? It is what it is. But no matter what, you can make an album and still impact the whole culture. So <laughs> yeah. that's what I'm so proud about with you guys. So I know right. we since yes, definitely for sure. And I know since we haven't talked about that, I know you still were doing songwriting after you and the group have dispersed. Um, you kind of went into your songwriting bag, so you kind of went in 2003, 2004. Really, on Confessions, you just went in overdrive on that. <laughs> so, so, I mean, I bought the seed twice. I bought Confessions <laughs> and the dual disc. So, y'all was a yes. I definitely did. So, I definitely was a part of that diamond group that you got, sir. So, when you were in your bag writing on the Confessions album, did you know that was going to be a, a hit? No. What? No, not at wow. all. Wow. Not at all. I mean, it was... um. It, truth be told, like you know, some of the stuff, like for instance, caught up. Like Usher didn't even like caught up, so it was hard. What? Oh no, 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 he didn't. Yeah, yeah, he wasn't. He wasn't really fucking with that record like that. So, wow. you know, at the time, I didn't necessarily know, like, oh my god, he's going to come out and sell twenty million records. Mm -hmm. Um, once again, I just was trying to do my best. I was just mm -hmm. trying to put my best foot forward and make some jamming ass music that I like, yeah. you know, and um. And that's what me and Pooh Bear and Dre and Vidal, the team, like we were just focused on making making what we like. Yeah. Um, Pooh Bear, I will say, he was like, "Yo," he said, "He gonna sell, he gonna sell twenty million records." I think Pooh Bear did say that. What? I mean, wow. Pooh Bear in the studio, but um, <clears throat> yeah. So nah, I didn't know it was gonna be as big as it was. I didn't know it was gonna be his biggest album and such a cult classic and stuff like that. I did not know, but I'm yeah. glad it was. <laughs> was it? I mean. I was ex I was literally a freshman in high school, yeah. and when I seen Usher put out all those songs, I was like, he finna do some numbers. <laughs> yeah. And I was 14 when it came out, so when I seen, and like I said, I, I've known about Usher since I was seven, so seeing his trajectory of her, how he was on my way to Confessions, I was like, he finna shoot off. And Superstar is that one. Part one and part two. Because everybody gets that moment and they move. But when I think about it, it reminds me of like a dreamy type of mode when I listen to it. Yeah. And it's very like groove mode, but you know, it's real R&B music. And that's what I love about, you know, your songwriting, your pen game, because you. what you have done for so many people, I mean, like Usher for Confessions and Justin Bieber and everybody wrote for Ro James and Luke yeah. James and everybody in the industry, you really have put your pen to work to make people understand that, you know, you are definitely here to stay. Hey, and not hey. even that, you have really have shown your work, no matter where your legacy is still pro, you know? You. And so just so proud of you. So I have another question. So I wanted to ask you, so since you are a dope songwriter, mm -hmm. what is the key <laughs> to making a hit? And then if you know that, what is one of your favorite songs of your hits from your catalog? I, I can't say what the key, the only key I can say to making a hit is, um, it has to connect. Mm. Obviously, obviously, it, it's got to connect. It's got to yes. connect on one level or another. So whether that be because you said the most profound thing, like, you know, yes. what's going on, you know, Marvin Gaye, or yeah. because you said something really simple and kind of silly, like Old Town <laughs> Road, like, you know what I mean? Yeah. If it connects... It, it, it's either gonna con it's gonna connect to people in some form or fashion. You're either gonna connect to my intellectual side and make me like, come on, you know, what would you do? You know what I mean? Or you're gonna connect to my silly side. You yeah. know what I'm saying? And it's just you know, Gucci gang, Gucci gang, Gucci. Yeah, uh, I just want to say that. <laughs> but it's just easy to say, and then, right? Um, I'm silly too. Everybody not deep all the time. Everybody yeah. not silly all the time. You know what That's I mean? Right. Or you gonna connect to my, you know, sexual side, and then it's like, you know, what I mean, you fucking with some wet ass, but like hell, <laughs> I want that. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> okay, but yes, I mean, right? Every demographic is very different from right? different so times. It's like, it's like, it's just gotta connect. Or you gonna connect to my heartfelt side? Come on. And you come out with, you know, like a hello, or or uh, like from Adele, or you know what I mean, something yeah. like that. Um, so it's just got to connect. It's got to resonate. 
It has yeah. to resonate and it has to connect with people. That's the key. How you get there, I don't know. Which one of those paths you take is up to you. Right. But you make sure, all right, I'm going to try to tap. I'm going to pull on people's heartstrings with this one. This is going to be a song, you know, mama, mama. Yeah. Everybody got a mama. So here you go. You know Come what on. I mean? Yep. Or, like, you know what I mean? Or I'm going to connect to people's, you know, ambitious drive side. You know what I mean? I'm all the way. Right. Everybody want to feel like they get money. Everybody want to get money. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to connect with them on that. Or like, yeah. so you just got to decide which route you want. Or I'm going to just connect to everybody's silly side. And I'm going to just, you know. <laughs> 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 just okay. Like, you know what I mean? Because we're all like, got our childish yeah. kitty side too. We do. It's just like a cool little goofy song just to sing, you know what I mean? While we brushing our teeth. Like, you know what I mean? Right, right. So, so, I think it's just all about connectivity when it comes to making a hit record. Right. Oh. Yeah. Well, you know, you in your bag with control myself because back in the day when I was in Louisiana, me and my family used to battle dance off that song. We was some battling folks. We was battling when LL Cool J and Jello did that. We would just battle, just dance. I was cutting up. Right. Couldn't right. break dance, but you know, I would try my best. That, but it that's, goes. That's, that's yeah. another way you can connect. Like, yo, man, I want to make people dance. That was Puffy's whole thing. You know, Puff Daddy. Wow. Bad boy, mm -hmm. he was like, we want to make you dance. Like, he said it on every song. We're here to make, we want to make you, I want to make you dance. I want to make you dance. Puffy was a dancer. I want to make you dance. I want to make you dance. I'm going to make you dance. <laughs> that's all he wants to do. <laughs> that's it. He wants to make you dance. <laughs> I can't. And he, he definitely did that. Yeah. In the nineties, yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. So yeah, yeah nah, I get it. Yes, that's all. That's really you gotta connect, man. Yeah, that's dope. Well, do you wanna? What do you know? What your favorite hit from your catalog is? Do you have a favorite hit? <sighs> it's hard to choose. I <laughs> like I'll go back and listen to I think something is my favorite, but then I'll hear it. No, I don't like, oh, this shit was jamming like yo. So <laughs> I don't know. I mean I, I I tell myself I'm still trying to write my favorite. Mm, you know I'm yeah. Still, I'm still looking to write my favorite. Yeah. I would I would say personally for me, my favorite from you is probably gonna be Superstar. That's gonna be my favorite. Because everybody loves Superstar. I mean, I remember like I told you when I was fourteen. I bought the actual one and the dual did. So that was the one that was really gravitating to me. I mean, that was just straight r and I mean, yeah. for that song to do what he did, I wish it could have been a single, but you know, it is what it is. Because, I mean, everybody was just, but you had caught up. So, I mean, yeah. either way it went, you had a single. But <laughs> for all the songs to just be so beautiful on the album, it was just so gravitating to what Usher was doing at the time. You really set him at a lane for himself. And just really just set the tone for him. I mean, because everybody, when they look back, everybody wants a confession album. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. We're not going to sit up here and stunt. Absolutely. Everybody wants a confession album, but you got to have the right people for it. Absolutely. I agree. Yeah. I agree. Too. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. So if you had to pick one of your favorite things, Ryan, that you do for creating an album, would it be singing, producing, or songwriting? Um, If I had to choose. <sighs> For a long time, it would have been um, like writing and producing because mm -hmm. I just enjoy being behind the scenes. I'm kind of shy. Right. So it's like, you know, I like being able to get in and get out and make, make the same money. Um, yeah. Not have to deal with all the extra stuff. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, but I think like nowadays, I enjoy making my own albums because it's like I don't have to try to cater to the artist. I ain't got to right. please, you know, the manager and the label person and the this one and the that one. I could just say whatever I want to say. I could just right. you know, do whatever I want to do and just get in my yeah. bag and just like, just get all my thoughts and feelings and emotions right. out. So I think nowadays I want to, I probably want to just sing my own shit. <laughs> I mean, but don't get me wrong. I love writing and producing. Yeah. Because it is what it is. And I, it, 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 it it's, it's, what I do and I yeah. love what I do but you know I like I had a lot of fun making my own stuff last summer it was very therapeutic for me you, you did know? I mean you got eight you got eight of them that's one year now so you one year on eight eight and then you got two more that's gonna make a year so absolutely what what I love what you do for yourself is you're very creative and you're very authentic to yourself 
So when it's you, I think you probably, I'm just assuming what, I, what I'm thinking of you is when it's you in the booth, you're really being pure to what you feel and what you yeah. love of R&B music. Yeah. And I know you did a Jodeci song too with Tank. I was like, whoa, you did Jodeci <laughs> record? I'm like, what? You had did an honor of Jodeci. So yeah. I just really thought it was dope. So for you to, you know, definitely for that, that's how we know you from. We know you from the singing, you know, from Oh Happy Day, you know? And I, that's really great that you really, think about that because a lot of people do think of you as a songwriter and the producer, but we love your voice too. And that always has to come together. So just so proud of you there. But yeah, singing, I'm, I'm happy you picked that. I thought you were going to say songwriting, but I, I definitely <laughs> want you to always have that voice because I mean, that's that's who you are. You are a singer, you know? Thank you. Thank you. So dope for that. So I have another question. So you had to describe one word about this City High album. What word would it be? One word? Yes. <laughs> I know what it is for me. What's it for you? Soul. Soul? Soul. Yes. Soul. <laughs> <laughs> it's some soul music. On, it's soul. Yeah. Um. Wow. One word to describe the album. Uh, man. One word. Uh, I would just say. Oh, you can say more than one word. <laughs> I mean, honestly, honestly, I'm just because I got to take myself back to that time. Right, 20 years ago, yeah. yeah you know, and I got to really <laughs> think, like, at that time, it was, like, raw. Like, it was just raw, you know raw. what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, we just, we didn't, we weren't trying to be, like, the pretty R&B group, even though we no, were like, like, a, like a big, like, a pop group we weren't trying to be like you know this like pop group we were just and we weren't trying to make a bunch of like soft love songs you know there's not one love song on the whole album you know not really no no, uh -huh. no there's no. not no. <laughs> i think because at that time too i think i might have been going through like a bad breakup too so i was just mm. fuck love like you know <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. We all have those. I know yeah. me. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, we were just trying to be yeah. raw. That's what I would. That's the word yeah. I would say. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I I could definitely say because it was a lot of raw moments with some of the records, like Cats and Dolls, talking about you know like. Cat best dogs, friends, like, like that's some that's some raw ass shit to say. Mars versus Venus, trust, that's a raw ass. That's, that's some gangster shit. Like every Ride song, or die. Was like didn't you? Was like you know what I'm saying? That was every song was like we was trying to be on some like yo, this the real shit. This ain't yeah. the I love you, old oh girl. What's up, shorty? You know, Caramel might have been the only one that was, but even then, she's she's spitting her shit. Like you know, mm -hmm. even though and I, then they have Eve on there. Don't have sex with you, like you know what I mean? She's like. <laughs> kicking her real shit like you know what I mean yeah and we didn't even talk about Eve to have Eve on there too y'all yeah. man yeah y'all had yeah. some heavy hitters I mean like I said why club just I mean wonder like y'all really really was um putting y'all bag in that and then Tim Dickinson he really reposted us too so yeah. so sweet for that thank yeah. you Tim absolutely and just right. really just understanding back then I said for me it was so because this is just I mean so so and it reminds me of so much 70s ask but it's 2001 you yeah, know yeah, yeah. and it takes you back into, into those times but you really you know have that blues soul mm -hmm. rhythm and blues things that's why i love your your content you wasn't talking about all the stuff that you know every r&b single wants to talk about which is really gravitating because when we do think about r&b we think about ballads and stuff like that and i'm a ballad person i love ballads but when i listen to city high in this album it really talks about real life women men and women issues that we go through. Yeah. I've been through a best friend type of situation. Yeah. I I haven't been to know what would you do, but I know people yeah. that have been yeah. in situations that come from poverty, you know? Yeah, yeah. And just coming oh, from maybe, so maybe, many maybe, things. Maybe you know a better word for the album then is real. Like you, you just Oh, <laughs> come on, real? You know what I mean? <laughs> Hey, real or wrong? And yeah. it is what it is. <laughs> and soulful. <laughs> and soulful. Thank real you. Thank raw soul. You know real raw soul. Real raw soul. Damn, on is. <laughs> I like it. Thank you so much, Ron. Thank you so much. So I wanted to ask you, do you have any advice for anybody that's trying to get into this music industry and just really are trying to make a breakthrough? And, you know, any advice you want to give to somebody that's really trying to, you know, come in and understand about what you've done and mm -hmm. help other people about getting in the industry, music industry? Uh, the best advice I can give for people trying to break into the industry is know yourself, yeah. stay true to yourself, <laughs> um, and make sure you're doing it for the right reasons. Um, yeah. And the, the right reasons, I mean, everybody's reasons vary from mm -hmm. person to person, but um, just make sure 
that you're, you, you, you've come to terms with why you want to do it because yeah. I, I meet so many young artists that you say, Oh, you know, I want to be in the industry. I want to da 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 yeah. And it's like, you know, well, why? Oh, oh, because, you know, I just feel like God, you know, meant for me to be da da. And I'm like, you think God, God meant for you to do what? Sing? Mm. Cause if it's singing, you don't need to be in the music industry to sing. Mm. Yeah. Right. You if, you if you feel like God meant for you to be a singer, we'll just we'll sing. You can sing. We'll sing. Right. Oh, yeah. Or, are we? Or do you want to be famous? Cause he now we don't know if God meant for you to be famous. Yeah. <laughs> totally. That's true. You That's very different. So, yeah. You know, you being born with a natural gift. You, okay. That's a tall tale sign that maybe God wanted you to sing. Cause listen, I open my mouth and it just comes out like that since I was two years old. But yeah, now, wow. You want to be a superstar and you want everybody yeah. screaming your name, that may or may not happen. And mm. are you okay with that? Are you gonna blame God for that? Or yes. are, you know what I mean? Are you gonna feel yeah. depressed because you couldn't get a record deal? Are you gonna yeah. feel like less than because you don't have five thousand people screaming your name every night? Mm. Like this is and and that that balancing act of emotions is where so many artists get jammed up because they they feel like, oh, I just feel like I'm born to do this. And right. everybody at my church told me I, I could sing. Everybody in my family says I'm so cute. Everybody in my yeah. city says, oh, girl, you so dope. You need to be, you You better than Beyonce. You better than, <laughs> yo, you better than Drake, bro. You spit harder than, the, okay, all right, okay. But then when they start getting in this game and they start finding out mm -hmm. that maybe at home you was one in a million, but out here in, in, in these waters, you won of a million. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> yeah. Because everybody can find a singer. You feel, you feel what I mean? Like, so, yep. so what makes you special and what makes you you and what makes yeah. you happy and what makes you worth something needs yeah. to come from within. Come on. You feel me? And yeah. you have to know that at all times because... The worst thing in the world, too, is if you do get it into the game, and let's say you do have some success, and now you're at the top of the top of the top. Do you know who you are? Do you remember mm. what you did this for? Right? Because then your yeah. next album come out, and let's say that joint break. Now you're mm. depressed, and you're on drugs. You don't know what to do. So yeah. your reason, your why was off. You didn't know who you are. So that's the yeah. best advice I can give. Like Because people want me to give... I get asked this question a lot, and it's like, you want me to give you some one, two, three step to becoming a, no. a rock star? <laughs> if there was a one, two, three step, everybody would be a rock star. Thanks. <laughs> so, so there's a thousand steps you could take. You want right. to take the road I took? Drop out of college, mm. sleeping on the studio floor. You know what I'm saying? Like, be, like you want to eat noodles and noodles every night. Like, drive an hour and a half back and forth to New York, back and forth, back and forth. Like, you, I can tell you the road I took. So for some other people, they took another road. Somebody like yeah. Cardi B, she started off in a strip club. You want to take that road? Like, it's mm -hmm. like, so Steve. Th there's a million different paths you can take. At the end of the day, you have to be true to thine own self. Be true. You have to, you have to have knowledge of self and know who you are. That's what's going to keep right. you. That's what, and, and that's what's going to make or break you. So like, if, if when they coming at you with different contracts or they coming at you wanting you to do different things, you have to know who you are. If you do yeah. get knocked down, are you able to get back up because you remember who you are? Right. Or are you going to get knocked down and stay down? You know what I mean? So that's really the best advice I can give because I can promise you this. No amount of money or fame will fix that if it's broken. Come on. And yeah. I'm telling you because I work with superstars all the time. Yeah. And I see it all the time. All the mm. money in the world. And they broken on the inside. Well, let's not forget, Whitney Houston died alone on drugs. Michael Jackson died alone <sighs> on drugs. Prince yeah. died alone on drugs. Elvis Presley died alone on drugs. Kurt Cobain, shall I go on? Amy Winehouse, shall I go on? Yeah. Amy Winehouse had a song. They trying to make me go to rehab. I said, no. Yeah. And we just dancing. Ah! And not getting and the girl lyrical singing, content. In the damn song. Yeah. You feel me? And people yeah. don't understand. People, man, I don't understand. I like to have all that money. And then and be and okay. not happy. Like, what do you mean how? Because that why has to it has to be rock solid. Who you are mm. and who God is to you, if you if there's a connection or none at all, whatever you choose, but you better know what it is. 
Amen. So, <laughs> yeah. That's the best OG advice. And that's OG advice right there. Take it or leave it. But I know mm. what I'm talking about. <laughs> Come on. Okay, so you better let these people know. Because mm. you done sold. You know how it is. But, you know, I love that, Ryan, because now you're giving people an insight of just being real and raw. You know what I'm saying? What we just talked about. Because people think that this industry is so, like, oh, it's about the glitz and grammar. It takes a lot to get to that. But the thing about it is, the maintainer of the success is so much. It's so much, and people don't understand. That's so right. just you, understand it from you. Everybody want to be famous, and they think everybody want to be famous. They think the fame and the money is gonna make things better. How is that gonna make things better? You're not gonna be yeah. able to go outside. You're not no. gonna be able to hang out with your friends. Mm -mm. You're not really go. And who's gonna really be able to relate to your life? You're the only superstar in the crew. Nobody yeah. else is as rich as you. Nobody else gets stopped by paparazzi. Just you. Yeah. Nobody else's name is in the tabloids. Just you. Yeah, just Whether you. it was your fault or not, your name gonna get popped up in the tabloid. Your homeboy is the one that got caught in the room with the girl. Your name Come is gonna be at the top of the headline. Yep. Yeah. Can you handle that? You think mm. right, you think all of that's gonna make you feel better? Yeah. You know what I mean? That every girl you meet from now on, every guy you meet from now on, you don't know if they really like you for you or not. Yeah. Or if the they motives. like for who you are. Like, that shit gets hard, bro. That shit yeah. gets deep. And it's like, you know, people just, they just want to be famous. I just want to be famous. I just want to be. So it's like, you're not, that wanting to be famous is not a purpose. Mm, a purpose. Come on. That's a pleasure. You feel me? So it's like, are you, are you, are you, cheating? are you after your purpose or are you just after yeah. pleasures? You know, yeah. that's the first question you need to ask yourself. Because if it's a purpose, then it's like this, you know, you see, um, you'll see, like certain, like let's take a sports athlete, like a football player. He right. might play. He might. Have, or let's 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 use the late great Kobe Bryant before he died. Oh, yeah. So Kobe played so many years. Mm -hmm. Then his career that with that that curtain was closing on his career. He was done. He retired. And what was he about to start doing? Coaching mm -hmm. his daughter. Coaching his daughter. He was gonna start writing books. He was. Mm -hmm. He was still gonna. He's still fulfilling a purpose. Yeah. His purpose was to touch people, touch the lives of people through the vehicle of sports or whatever. You know what I mean? Yeah. But he knew his purpose. You know how many athletes retire and go crazy, depressed, blow their head and blow their brains out? Mm -hmm. Start beating their wife. They don't know how to act in the real world. Yeah. Without the, the, the fans and the women and the lights and the this and that, they don't mm -hmm. know who they are. Yeah. And it's so important yeah. to know who you are because when you know who you are, then whether I'm doing it at this level or at this yeah. level, I'm doing it. <laughs> and yeah. those are the winners. Yeah. Those are the winners. Like, I did my thing. Like, it don't, yeah. like and that's that's what I'm striving for. I'm striving to right. just continue to serve my purpose. So whether it be in front of the camera, behind the camera, on the stage, from yeah. that stage, if I'm the guy on the mic, if I'm the guy behind the guy on the mic, the mic. <laughs> Like, I just want to always be living my purpose. My That's purpose, right. You know what I mean? To be a creative and to just give people the beauty of music. That's right. my purpose. Now, Come I can't on. control whether it go number one or not. That's not my concern. Right. It used to be, and I was real depressed for a long time. Right, right. So I, I clawed and clawed and fought my way up out of that dark valley. And, that's, and, and I'm, I'm healthy. And I thank God that I'm healthy. I ain't got no coke habit. I ain't got right. 150 babies all over the place. I ain't got. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> That's true. Look. You know what I mean? That's I'm, just, true. I'm so thankful I can, I can yeah. still sit here and do interviews with people like yourself and still be a blessing to the culture. Still, yes. You know what I mean? That's because I know who I am. Amen. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's the best advice I can give. Sorry, I, I went for a rant. No, no. You have to drop that because what? <laughs> Oh, but I love it, though, Ryan. What I'm I'm loving and what you're saying is mental health is the key. Mental health is the key. Yeah. And I'm just, I'm so proud that you still are so true to who you are. But not, not only that, you really do interviews with people like myself. I'm not a known person like that. I may interview so many superstars, but I just, I, I see you as human. I want to see you as a human being just like I am, but it's on a, I know you're on a different level versus to who I am, but my thing about you, you treat me as a person. And that's what I respect. So Likewise. no matter what. Likewise. Yes, thank you. I yes, agree. thank you so much. And Ryan, I'm just so happy. I know we're done with our interview. So sad, but <laughs> you have gave me so much light and so much joy. And I just appreciate, you know, this album just being such a classic. Yeah. You know, 20 years later, my 11-year-old self 
blasting a cassette table <laughs> city high. But it goes to show you that you meant something to me. I mean, well, since I was six, but to me, Thank but you. the culture, but not even that, you know, you are, your legacy is here. Your flowers are given on my platform. So proud of you. So blessed. Mm -hmm. And thank you so much. Give Claudia my love for me Absolutely. to her. Thank you so much. Like I said, tell her she body the only one I trust. That's my jam. Absolutely. <laughs> but, I, but I will tell you this, city high. You guys are a gem, and no matter what has happened, whatever you guys are in the world, you really have touched so many people. So thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. Thank, thank you. you so much. <laughs> I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you for, you know, reminding me, because I forget sometimes. I ain't going to lie, but, you know. You what? Know, like, it reminds you better, me. You know what I mean? Count you better mother. let these people know you've been, you been diamond plenty of times. I'll, I'll let them know. I'll run your history down. Like, listen, I tell people all the time. Listen, I will listen, run your the history don't down. Lie. The don't lie. <laughs> the numbers never lie, and I will run your history. Let these people know. Don't play with my Toby. Hmm. I appreciate it. <laughs> nah, 